Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined once again today by retired Master Sergeant John Keane, uh, the uh, NFA expert, the machine gun, and other assorted cool toys expert for Morphe Auction Company. Yes, thank you. And we have a bunch of questions from the fantastic people on the Forgotten Weapons Patreon to ask John. So let's just dive right into it. Sure. All right, our first question is from Mark, who says... What's the best course of action to follow when selling a transferable SMG? Timeline and auction house suggestion? I'm pretty sure I know what auction house you're going to suggest. Well, but what's uh, the process like for selling a transferable? Well, the first thing, first thing you have to, if we make for the assumption it is fully transferable, we'll give, make that as a given. Uh, what you want to do is you want to contact uh, somebody who can tell you what the gun is worth or likely to bring. And then, uh, and then you have to consider, uh, do you really, what are you looking for to occur? Usually people say, I want to get the most money into my pocket. And, and, that, and, that the, and that's the case, um, uh, you know, coming here to, to Morphe's, we can give a really great terms on something like that. And you can see that by the evidence of what we prices realize that we get really great dough. But uh, you have to consider, all right, how big is it? How is it going to get to the auction company? You know, Morphe's will often uh, be able to pick up the gun, you know, right at location after the approval of the transfer. When it's a, an estate situation, you have to have a whole bunch of documents that convey that. You have to have the, what they call legal letters of administration that show you, the person, has the, uh, has the authority to transfer the gun. Okay. But if it's just a, you know, a person, yeah, I've got a submachine gun and I want to sell it through the uh, auction company, uh, what I want to do is uh, you know, pick up the phone and give us a call and ask to talk to John Keene or send in an email and uh, it'll get forwarded over to me and I'll get in touch with you and uh, we'll go over the terms and the process and so forth. So what's the, the time frame and scale? If someone's got a gun on a Form 4, presumably they've aren't going to be immediately familiar with what a Form 4 is, but you're private owner, you don't have a dealer's license or anything, you just, you inherited a submachine gun, right. you got it somewhere, and yeah. now you want to sell it. Um, how long does it take? What's... Yeah, here's, here's a good phrase that I like to use is, think, think of the machine gun as almost like an automobile. It's registered to somebody, right? right. The owner of an automobile deceases. The heir or whoever the administrator of the estate or whoever it's going to be, they have a responsibility to to transfer legally and orderly transfer the ownership of that automobile to somebody. It can sit in the garage for decades, registered to the dead person. But the right thing to do is to get it transferred. And if you've got the registration thing, it, it will take anywhere from two months to six months. We've gotten a couple of records transfers in here. I've gotten a, a transfer through uh, on a on a state situation in 14 days. Jeez. From the date we submitted the forms. Because we, we prepare all the paperwork for the consigning client. Of course, we're very experienced in this. And we, the people at the BATF, I think they know us. <laughs> I suspect that they do. And, 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 they, <laughs> and I know for a fact that I've had some conversations where they say, well, you need to correct the overall length. You need to correct this. We can do that fairly quickly. They've never actually said it, but I think they know that if it comes into this company and we're handling it, it's going to go out of here what it is. In other words, if it was misregistered with the wrong barrel length or wrong overall length, we're going to get that corrected. And, okay. and, and they like that. They like that. Are the estate transfers faster than just a regular person-to-person -person form yes. four? Yes, they are. Okay. And that makes a good segue into something that there are relatively few in number form five transfers as opposed to say form three transfers or form four transfers five is the inherited oh, gun five is an inherited gun or a deactivated <laughs> gun it's not live and uh, and so because there are fewer in that category they can tend to be able to process them quicker hmm. more quickly okay. they That's also are more quickly transferred into an active FFLSOT on a Form 4 than they were, say, I transferred mm -hmm. mine to you, assuming you were in the same state. Okay. Or CNR license holders. Okay, cool. Uh, next up, we have Jerry, 
on a totally different subject. Uh, were there any German gun manufacturers during World War II that cut the Werner von Braun treatment, like lesser sentences or scrubbed charges entirely? Uh, or we just rely on captured weapons to borrow from German weapons expertise? Uh, well, certainly during the war, we grabbed what we could and we reverse engineered and tried different programs and said, ooh, how does this work? But I'll tell you, there was a tendency during verse after the First World War and certainly as well as during and after the Second that we want to give American industry the money. We want to give Americans the credit of our design, let our designers and develop our thing. Uh, let the, uh, uh, but as far as the, the, the question, the first part of the question is, did we give special treatment to people with expertise? I don't believe we did. I think we, I think we, we if they were something useful, Yes, immediately after World War II, we left them in their civil positions and their positions of expertise. Uh, fortunately, I am of an age that I was able to talk to a number of veterans of World War II, even to including some German hmm. veterans of World War II. And one in particular, and the audience may find this entertaining, he was a, a drill instructor, equivalent of a drill instructor. He was in Austria. And he said, I had it made. I was a drill instructor on a base. And I was training troops, and the beautiful girls were all around, and most of the young men were away, and the recruits didn't go, didn't, didn't go near the girls because I was a non-commissioned officer, and they were going to give deference to me, particularly as I was real instructor. And I had it made. He said, and then I made a mistake. I didn't know I made it, but I made it. I, 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 I attracted the attention of a girl that... Uh, one of my superior officers was interested in, and he said it just like it was right to the Russian front for me. <laughs> and he ended up he ended up in the in the Crimean pocket, and he was wounded. And he said it saved my life. I got wounded. I got evacuated back, and everybody else in my unit didn't return. Wow, they were cut off. And he lay. And he and he was wounded so he could no longer be in frontline service. So he went into the armaments industry working in Steyr. Hmm. And, uh, and he said he, they were putting together MG-42 machine guns. Um, and he said at the, at the end of the war, in April, May, 45, they had warehouses filled with MG-42s, but they couldn't get any rail transport to transport them to where they needed to be. Uh, and after the war ended, uh, they they looked him over and said, "Well, you're not you're not an a, a infamous Nazi, so we like your expertise. We're going to let you continue to work at Steyr." And he said, "What he did is he uh, continued to make and fit scopes on sporting rifles for high-ranking American, hmm. British, and Austrian and hmm. former Austrian officers." Uh, and I asked him how he came to the United States. He said, "Oh, yes, I decided I would get some education." And I became a doctor, and then I came to the United States. He, he is, of course, now deceased. But one of the things that was interesting, he lived in, well into his 90s, and he had been my doctor when I was a child. And, and, I, and, and some of the interest was there. And he, I remember him asking me, what is an MP40 worth? And he would always ask that question, and another machine gun. He would always ask me that question, and I would always reply, well, do you have one? Oh, no. <laughs> you would always <laughs> ask what they were worth. So you can kind of read between the lines there. It um, actually explains a lot that your pediatrician built MG42s. It just was happenstance. <laughs> it was just happenstance. My grandfather had far more of an influence on my gun hobby as a veteran of the First World War than, uh, than my pediatrician, but it was fun, kind of interesting that he did. When, we, when the U.S. continued arms development after World War II, we really didn't follow any of the German development tracks. Um, there was a little bit of experimentation, but it's not like we brought over, you know, a, a German design bureau and set them up here. Um, the Russians had a couple of guys that they took, but it's questionable how much they actually used them. Uh, the French got a bunch of guys from Mauser. And they designed a bunch of guns, and the French didn't adopt any of them, and those, the Mauser engineers kind of got annoyed and left and went to Spain. There wasn't that much. Like, the British were really excited about German aircraft cannons. 
um, and did some development along those lines. I'll but, give you. I'll give you a little personal. I had an occasion to talk to the younger uh, Theodore Metaxas, uh, and his father was Ted Metaxas. He was a major, come lieutenant colonel, World War Two, and and the younger Metaxas told me how uh, some of the machine guns that his father had brought back were actually requisitions for study mm -hmm. uh, for you know rates of fire and you know why does the MD42 have the rate of fire it does. And, uh, and it, they did actually loan those war trophies out to the, hmm. to the developers for, for a while. That leads us to a question from USA USA, who asks if the USA T24 project could have worked, that being converting the MG42 to 30-06. Absolutely, it could have worked. I Why think. didn't it then? I have my own thought on this, but I'm curious well, to hear yours. Why didn't it work? I think it was because of a lack of real will to follow it through and really knock out the kinks. It was a kind of, well, let's see if we can do it, if we can do it with ease. We certainly could have done better than we did, and another country did, and I'm sure you're going to mention that. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it was, a, it was, I think it was a lack of will and a more of a desire to support American design than to adapt a German foreign design. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, Saginaw handed Saginaw got that project to convert the forty-two, and they handed it off to a third-party subcontractor, who did a pretty cut-rate job at it. They built two, and of course, rather famously, neither of them works. The ejection ports are too short; too short. they don't eject well, and that's because not because they couldn't figure out how to build them, but because they didn't build new ones. They took two existing captured MG forty-twos and made some changes and. But they're German receivers. That's why the ejection ports are short. It's interesting that the Germans took a very different approach to it, especially in World War One. They were converting Russian Maxim state millimeter, and uh, and uh, and so did the Norwegians take a different mm -hmm. approach and say, oh, "We're going to convert them to our caliber." And well, in both of those cases, the country in question didn't have a lot of machine guns. The Norwegians weren't really building anything domestic. Uh, the Germans in World War One needed everything they could get. Russians had a lot of Maxims at the beginning of the war. Yeah. If you look at the serial numbers, and I didn't bring one with me, but I've got a Russian that has uh, 1916 date, and it's like 21,000. Yeah. It's a lot of Maxims that early. When you look at the U.S. in World War II, we didn't, especially late World War II, by the time we're considering maybe re-engineering the MG-42, we didn't need a lot of machine guns. We had massive industrial production. We were supplying guns to everybody. And it would be industrial. It's just easier to keep building what we're building and maybe expand that production than to take on some brand new project. We certainly project. do the expanding and give contracts and open new factories. Yeah. We certainly were doing that. And the U.S. didn't want the features that are really stand out on the MG-42, like the rate of fire. Those T-24s, one of the criteria for their conversion was, we want the rate of fire to be at like 600. So, you know, what's the point of using an MG-42? you got to remember also that in the, in the early years, certainly prior to World War II, ammunition cost was a very high consideration yeah. in, the American, in, the, in the American genre. I mean, look at the rising, you have to have a smaller capacity magazine. Look at the Thompson with its 20-round magazine. And there are other examples where it was like, oh, we're going to be kind of frugal on ammunition. We don't want our soldiers shooting up too much ammo. So let's not give them a big magazine. Uh, Greg says, in the current time period, fall, winter 2023, are there any transferable machine guns that are selling for what you would consider undervalued prices or any that are selling for more than what you think they're worth? With, I'll throw in the caveat of if there is anything underpriced, it won't be by the time this video goes out. Well, uh, what I am, what I'm seeing happening right now is I am seeing uh, high levels of inflation. I'm seeing rising expenses for everything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing businesses that are they're going to have to absorb those rising high costs, and they have to increase their revenue to ensure their profitability. I also see some uncertainty coming into an election year, I think. And uh, so we just had an auction 
we had several world record prices and uh, and I have had people, they always do, they call me after the office and say, hey, how do we do, what do you think, and give me your insight, now I'm going to give it to everybody who's watching this, is for the really fine specimens of their kind that are rare and mainstream collectible, there are buyers who are very robust and they want it and they will pay really good money to get it and they will shoulder themselves aside to get at it. If there is anything that is going to be a potential bargain, it's going to be something that is of a generally of a lesser condition, perhaps missing some parts uh, uh, or something that is maybe not quite so mainstream or something that is, is pretty sure you're, you're going to be able to get one next time around. Uh, yeah, I've got, uh, and I've published it a couple of times, it's probably time for me to put it out again. Uh, I have a three, art, three article series on, you know, what, what to consider when buying a machine gun and, and some advice regarding that. I'm not going to give it all away here, but one of the things I will say is when you have competing uh, desires for your money to go somewhere, you know, buy the thing that is highest condition best of its kind you can and have it be the thing that you're less likely to encounter in the future. If you're looking at a, a, a vector Uzi, well we know there were several thousand of those made. They were fully transferable and they're pretty much all still out there. Yeah. Whereas if you want to look at something like that, well not so much, not right. so many. Okay. And uh, so... Uh, to be fair though, that's kind of... oh that. That's valid advice, regardless of the particular season or right. fluctuating conditions. Well, I'll say this. There's a lot of people in this country with a whole lot of money. They can write a check for pretty much any amount they want. If you're one of those people, congratulations. You can assemble a great collection. If you're not one of those people, hope that one of those people don't want the same thing you do, because they can blow you out of the water. Yeah. And, I, and I've had the experience with people on the phone with me who want to bid on a certain gun, and I don't even get a chance to put a bid in for them because it's gone crazy. So is there, some, is there, is there an opportunity right now, in the right now, September, fall of 2023, for machine guns? Uh, I'll stick with mine. My, if, you've got the, if you've got the ability to buy something that doesn't have maybe a couple of parts, but you know where you can get the parts, or you think here you can get the parts in the future, you might be able to put a bargain together. Uh, it's always chancy when you decide to purchase a deactivated machine gun with a plug chamber, because sometimes you say, oh, well, that won't be a problem. And then you take it to your gunsmith guy, and he takes a look at it and says, Ugh, that's a problem. <laughs> you know? But, uh, no, I, I think that it's going to be tough to get a bargain on machine guns. Yeah. Uh, generally, there's a lot of interest in them. And people are not that comfortable with the traditional financial documents. There aren't really hidden deals in the machine gun world. No. Sadly. Um, Fire Tower says, if the registry reopened, what kinds of new categories of machine guns do you think might become popular among regular citizens? Given most machine guns today are made for a military customer, obviously things like the MP5 would be popular, but would we see more things like American 180s? like recreational fun guns, or would it be more practical stuff? you have any thoughts if, on that? If they opened up, if they opened up, and this is a wonderful question, it gives me a segue to say something about it. If they were to allow, say, a 180-day period where you could register machine guns, it is likely that they would make it a limited amnesty, like something along the lines of, as long as you can prove it's curio relic eligible, and it already exists, we'll allow you to send in your Form 1 and register it. But if you're going to go into your garage and put something together, we don't care for that. Or they may not do that. It, it all comes down to, I guess if you say, all right, we're going to just wave a magic wand, yeah. and we're going to say we're going to do this, and it's going to be a, a complete amnesty. As far as what guns would be popular, the World War II guns would be hands down the top that people would want. Would there be a new genre of American 180s? Uh, there would be a lot of 
auto sears being registered i would say that would be the thing that would be the hottest thing going because you punch out as many auto sears as you can and you try to make them as undifferentiated as you can so you can convert existing semi-autos to full and you can take and pick and choose i think we get you want. a lot of the semi-auto pistol caliber carbines the nine millimeter ars the cz scorpions the stuff in that genre that guys are using for ipsc pistol caliber carbine division. I think a lot of those would turn into machine guns because they're cheap and they're fun. And I'm going to say there are, there are really, there are the enthusiasts who want them because they're historical interest or the designs are cool or they're interesting in the way they were made and they operate. Then there's a whole lot of people who they want a gun, they can take and put rounds in the magazine, stick it in the magazine wheel and go rat-a-tat-tat. Yeah. And that's what they want to do. And uh, so uh, I think you'd see, I think I, I concur. There'd be a lot of people who'd convert a lot of the pistol caliber guns because they're cheap and they're easy um, and they run. Uh, but uh, there would be a, a, a very large number of World War I and World War II guns that would come to the surface. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Michael asks, have any crew served machine guns suffered from being open bolt design? Or is open bolt on a crew served gun always a good thing? I'm thinking about that. So the one example I'll bring up is crew served guns, but not necessarily in a crew served environment. And that is World War I aircraft guns. Because open bolt stuff couldn't be effectively synchronized. And that's part of the reason you see Vickers and Maxim guns um, as the aircraft, the, the standard aircraft synchronized guns is because they were closed bolt firing, which means the delay from when you pull the trigger to when the bullet fires out is completely predictable. Open bolt guns, if the gun gets a little hot or a little cold or a little dirty, that lock time will change enough to mess up a synchronizer. That is an excellent observation. I can't believe it wouldn't have, wouldn't have occurred to me, I don't think, but you, you were right, absolutely right. Uh, Irrelevant in the 21st century, yeah. Uh, but uh, but a but a very valid point. I don't see a big problem with closed door open bolts. I don't see a real advantage of one or, or the other, except when the open bolt guns they they will cool themselves off mm -hmm. faster than a closed bolt gun will, and they are generally easier to perform immediate action on. I think that's true. Than the you got a little less bolt. going on. And so I would I would think I would prefer, although I'll say this, and some very venerable men now no longer with us who are in the collecting and machine gun hobby have said, pretty hard to improve on the Maxim and the Vickers. You certainly are going to have a hard time improving on their endurance, and you're going to have a hard time improving on the ability to convert them to different calibers of your choice. And fortunately for us, there tends to be plenty of parts around to keep them running. Unfortunately, I'm going to say, and this is probably a question that's going to come up later in this, is the more knowledge required of the firer would-be owner, the less interest seems to be in taking them out to the range and shooting them. You know, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Give me a gun that I can just put a magazine in and shoot it and go right at that tat. And then there's also the consideration as we age of, all right, I got to pick up the gun and take it, and I got to pick up the tripod and take it. I got to pick up the ammunition and take it. I got to make sure I have the belts. I got to make sure I have the rods. I have to make sure I have all that stuff. And when I'm all done, now I got to you know, and I got to take it all apart, and I've got to clean it. And nah, 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 nah. whereas, if it's something like this, taking an old belt-fed heavy out to the range is a it's a significant affair. All right, Jonathan says I'm looking to buy my first full auto. And I think I'd like to get an M50 Rising. Um, what is the best first-time buyer transferable machine gun? Ah, that's a good question. It's something I always publish in that little article thing I talk about. A good entry level machine, a Rising, it would be would be one of them. It's inexpensive relative to the other models out there. Yes, a mere eight to ten thousand dollars these days, probably compared to a mere <laughs> four and five hundred when they were first offered to me. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, so they are, you can, you can have a lower cost there, but then to get 
the magazines, you're going to see a higher cost. Yes. Uh, so uh, entry-level machine guns, pretty hard to beat the MP40 as far as a, really? a, a, okay. tube, a tube gun. And I, I say a, a not a CNR specimen. You're going to pay a bunch of money. You're going to put pay into the teens and maybe into the high teens. But you're going to get a gun that's iconic. You're going to get a gun that runs. You're going to get a gun where you can get parts. You can get a gun where you have ammunition available. And, and, uh, and it's a and it's a, and it's a really nice, slow-firing, comfortable gun to shoot. Uh, another, what used to be, I used to consider a really good entry-level machine gun would be a Smith and Wesson Model Seventy Six. Hmm. Again, cost was relatively low, and you can get magazines and you can get ammunition, and the parts weren't hard, and they run well, and they're comfortable to shoot. Uh, Rising is a really good choice, and it's one of the ones I say is a good. Uh, choice pistol caliber. I really kind of want to get a Rising. Like, ever since I started really reading up on early World War II Pacific stuff, Guadalcanal, and I, maybe it's because I'm a bit of a masochist and I like my show shop, but I feel like the Rising would be a really cool <laughs> well, companion. Well, you're in luck because we're going to have some Risings in the next few sales. Okay. I've got some on consignment that'll be coming in. For the less historically oriented, I'd say the the M11A1. Mac is an excellent choice. That's a whole great genre because, there. Because of the work of one Richard Lage. <laughs> the guy. Yep. Who has, uh, thanks to Lage, you, well, and other people as He's well, but Lage the is price the point best. of those guns. Yeah. You can get a myriad of different conversion uppers, um, up to and including a 5.56 light machine gun upper. Um, that's an, it's an expensive upper, but. You know, you couple a three thousand dollar five five six upper with an eight thousand dollar registered Mac, and you've got like a poor man's a saw. Very perfor well performing machine. Yeah, yeah, it's, and lots uh, of nine millimeter uppers for them as well. Yeah, so it's a really good choice, and I don't usually, I gotta say, I have not usually considered them, but they are very much a good entry level machine gun for all the points you mentioned, and they're plentiful. Yeah, exactly. You're. Okay, I shouldn't say we're never going to run out of them, but they will always be at a lower price. I than know. Most I have seen pallets of them yeah. at a time. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, Nicholas says, my machine gun buddy, machine gun collecting buddy, loudly decries the Colt balloon guns as worthless, uninteresting, and having value only as side plate donors for more interesting builds. Uh, of course, by balloon gun, he means the 11 millimeter aircraft Vickers guns, ventilated jackets. Uh, usually found slightly bent, missing internal parts. Slightly? Incomplete. Okay, maybe <laughs> largely bent. Sledgehammer, you mean. Uh, what are your thoughts on guns being stripped or destroyed to essentially make copies of other models? From a historical perspective, I find it horrifying, says Nicholas. It comes under the heading of, if you own the gun, what do you want to do with it? Now, if you've got an 11 millimeter Colt Vickers... And there is a supply of available Colt Model 1915 water cool kits around. Why would you not convert those guns over to the water cool 1915? Uh, Money wise, it's a good thing to do. Historical wise, you're taking one model and another model, their brethren. Um, now, but you are converting an authentic piece into a less than authentic. You know, I, a, I guess you can say when you talk, you talk about Conqueror's show car kind of rules, yeah, you're taking something more than 11. When and you talk about 30. by the best condition example you can ever find, mm -hmm. a side plate Vickers built from a balloon gun is never going to be as desirable as an all original Vickers. Colt 1915 Vickers. True. Or True. even a, any other Vickers. And, I'll, and, I, and, and Mike, you're out there. I know you're watching this. Uh, 11 millimeter Vickers can be brought to life. Mm -hmm. They can be fired and shot, and they're fun. Uh, one of my mentors took an 11 millimeter balloon gun Vickers, and he converted it to shoot 458 Winchester Magnum, just to see, what? If, he, just to see if he could. Holy crap. Just to see if he could, using 11 millimeter wow. balloon gun links and parts and, and stuff like that. And it 
had a lot of energy. Let's put it I that way. I bet it did. He put and, a very heavy barrel in that thing. He did. He did, he did spring barrel, and he didn't do very much shooting with it, but then he decided it would be better to shoot it in 4570, which was a much more fun That I can believe conversion. a little more uh, cost-effective, too. And, uh, <laughs> and, and just to let you all know, there are at least two out there in 4570. Okay. Uh, the thing that will happen eventually with balloon guns is, I mean, we can talk about whether it's a good idea or not to convert them into other things, but people are going to, for all the reasons you just said. There's, you can't do anything with a balloon gun, and they're usually missing parts and broken. And you can do stuff with these parts kits that are readily available. So people will be doing it, and eventually we'll hit a new equilibrium where the new thing is going to be like, oh, oh, you've got a complete balloon gun. That's like the scarce, desirable you thing have, because now they're complete, Yeah, if you have a complete 11 millimeter balloon gun that's never been hit with a sledgehammer, never had the extractor face screws broken off, and it's matched, you've got something good there, and it's you know, museum-level stuff. But I question whether it's ever going to hit what an original Colt 1915 is. No. So it, it does come back to what I said initially. It's up to the owner and what their personal desires are. Yeah, I hear what the gentleman says about it's horrifying to cut or take a plate off a Colt boom gun and put it on another Vickers or to make this other thing. But if you want to shoot your machine gun, your choices are you can convert that 11 millimeter to one of the other calibers, which you can do. Mm -hmm. um, or you can move that plate over onto one of the water cool guns. It, as much as I also dislike the notion of destroying an authentic piece of history to build something else, there is a consideration of how, what is the historical interest in a parts kit that you may have? Maybe it's not just a run-of-the-mill generic World War II British Vickers gun, but there are some more exotic a patterns. Five-arch Vickers Turkish. And it's one thing to have that parts kit as a pile of parts. It's another thing to, like, it's a, it's a step up for that parts kit to turn it into a working gun, even if it's not the original receiver plate. Here's, here's, a, here's something that you will appreciate, the person who put this in there. I've had people contact me at the auction company. They have a registered uh, Panzer Shrek destructive oh, device. Interesting. Registered Panzer Shrek. That's the bazooka style one. And that's right. Not and, the single and Not use. the Faust, but the, the Shrek. And they talked to me on the phone. They asked me what I thought it would bring. I gave them the evidence of what sales prices have been in the past. And in the end, they cut a great big hole in it oof, and sold it as a display piece because they can get more money for the person who wanted it as a display piece then who didn't want to have to worry about going through the transfer right. and David D and all that kind of stuff. They just wanted it up there. And, uh, and there is, there, there it is. Did I feel very bad that a, that a registered destructive that, device got destroyed? That really sucks. That yeah. sucks in a way. But the person who wanted the hundred dollar bills in their hand wanted the hundred dollar bills in their hand. That is a person who is not a collector. <laughs> I'm going to say this. I feel right? an authentic collector would not have, there are, there are three kinds of people. There are collectors, there are investors, and there are speculators. Yeah. And that's what they are. Uh, I have to say I understand the buyer's market, though. I have a French 50 millimeter Model 1937, adorably tiny little light mortar, and I found one that was deactivated with a hole cut in it, and I bought it. It wasn't that expensive. And um, you actually had one show up here that was live and transferable. Well, the, all destructive was, devices are transferable, but it was live and registered. And it also wasn't that expensive, but I really wasn't that interested in buying it because I don't, I'm never going to shoot the thing. Case in I, point. I don't anticipate shooting it. Yeah. It is just a display piece for me, and it just wasn't worth the extra money and the legal oversight to deal with it. So and, and I wouldn't cut a hole in one. But I've also already you demonstrated you that you I'm not in the market to buy one. didn't pony up your money to buy one that right. is live. But there is a very significant, very passionate segment of the collecting and shooting world that love to shoot those mortars yes. and, and make the projectiles for them and do different innovative things. 
And let me tell you, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I can believe that. It's a lot of fun. And there's certain models of those mortars that are hot, hot, hot. You know, the okay. finished smoke mortar where you have to pull a lanyard and you shoot a shoot a, a 12 gauge blank to make the projectile go up. You don't have to worry about doing anything with the projectile. Great stuff, nice. recreational. Um, Michael, a different, I feel like we're, yeah, this is a different Michael. It says, suppose you walked into a hardware store in 1933 and you bought a Thompson for cash off the rack which you could do at that time, uh, no different than buying a hammer. Uh, what would you have had to do, assuming you didn't die by now, you're somehow still alive today, uh, what would you have had to do to keep that gun legal? And then when the National Firearms Act was passed, it went into effect in 1934, you had the opportunity to submit for the registration of it. Hopefully you did it soon, early enough, before they ran out of stamps. What? Well, this is, when the this national, is a new element to me. When the they, National Firearms Act was, was passed, the idea behind that legislation was, oh, we're going to double the price of what it costs to buy a Thompson, and that'll get prohibitive for people to want to buy the Thompson. Thompson was crazy expensive. 200 bucks was a ton of money in 33, 34. What did a car cost in 1930? I know it was on that order of magnitude. Yeah, that's right. And... So you just doubled the price of, of an already expensive gun, and that was going to be a deterrent. The point was to ban them, but you couldn't legally ban them, so you just put a prohibitive tax on them. And they also said, well, we'll do this. We'll, we'll print stamps, but we're only going to print up X number of stamps. And, and then when those stamps are done, anybody who wants to have a machine gun is going to have to wait until we print some more stamps. And we decide how many stamps we're going to print. And when never we're going to print this. them. Okay. You didn't know about that. But that's, that's part of what it was. So you could put them in every once in a while. And they're, they're, always, they're, they're always very, they do very well at auction. Every once in a very in a blue moon, I get one in that's got the original 1934 wow. registration with it. Um, by the way, that National Firearms Act effectively put the Maxim Silencer company out of business. Yeah. They pretty much decided to stop being in business or to stop selling firearm suppressors before that point. But yeah, that was that was the end of firearm silencer development. That was it. Because that was like a two dollar suppressor, right? With a two hundred dollar tax on it. Yeah. Like and and so yeah. so you had an opportunity in thirty four to do it. Subsequently, it, uh, let me interrupt you for just a yeah. moment. Do you have any idea of how? well publicized that was like how many people knew that this law took effect or was it you know oh we passed it no one really talked about it people woke up in 1942 and oh wow what there's a registration i don't think it was all that well publicized uh judging by the number of original 1934 registrations that i see come through personally uh most of what i see coming through are amnesty registered okay. pieces, uh, which were no cost. That helps. And By 68, $200 is not as much money, but it's still a substantial well, amount of money. And then there was the opportunity for you to find the gun in your grandfather's attic, and you could either put it in as a $200 Form 1 registration, or after the deactivated war trophy program was instituted, you could register for zero. That's why I was just having a conversation with somebody recently about why there's so many deactivated machine guns out there. Well, because if you were a soldier coming back from the Second World War, and let's say you were a non-commissioned officer, a sergeant, well, maybe you got as much as $40 or $50 a month. Maybe. $200 for that $200 tax stand a lot of money. You, you can give me four months pay and you can bring your war souvenir home live, or you can not do anything and just quietly bring it home and not worry about complying with the law, which what most did. And then, holy crap, there's thousands of guns coming into the country that are black market. Probably got to do something. Well, can't argue with the economics of it. He said, let's do a deactivated war trophy program. It won't cost them anything. So plug your chamber, make it so you can't change your barrel out. No cost, just send the form in. Oh, I'm up for that. No cost to do that. So you had your opportunity over the course of the time, and then and, and the big amnesty happened in the wake of the the assassinations of 
of Kennedy and Kennedy and Martin Luther King and and uh, so now we're going to do this amnesty period and that's where a lot of them got registered and then if you still are alive and you still haven't registered that Thompson uh, you were essentially legally out, out of luck. luck. That's one of the interesting significant differences between US and most European laws is in most European countries a someone who is the equivalent of uh, an SOT has the ability to legally to legalize an unregistered gun. If they come across something that's not registered and can and needs to be, they can essentially they can register it themselves and put it into the system as a way, I mean, from the government's perspective, it's a way to try and actually be aware of all the guns that are floating around on the market. But it also means that gun, once legalized, can be sold through legal channels above board. And in the U.S., we just, other since the 68 amnesty, there's been no way to legally legalize an unregistered machine gun. There is a caveat to that, which I will give you. Okay. If you are a legal manufacturer of machine guns after... The amnesty of nights and there were there was somebody who used Thompson as an example. There was a gentleman who made Thompson receivers and registered them. And you could take the parts off of the Thompson you bought in nineteen thirty three and you could move those parts onto the receiver that this gentleman had made and he made I think it was thirty or fifty of them. And they are there, they're out in the hmm. registry, and we have carried them here in this auction before, and they are they are not only legally live, transferable Thompsons, but they are also curio and relic, even though they were not, and are not, 50 years old. Hmm. Because the BATF ruled that all Thompson models are <laughs> curio and relic. Oops. They, they goofed on that one. And, and why is it that an 1896 Brass Maxim isn't an antique? Well, wait, we already had that conversation. Yeah, they said so. <laughs> now, now, legally speaking, that's not legalizing an existing machine gun. That is making a new machine gun in the U.S. Right. Unlegally. And then the original, the, the receiver from the Thompson that you take all the parts off of remains an illegal machine gun. That is under, under the law. So, yes, that is true. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. But the question was, what would you have to do? <laughs> right. And there it was. Um, uh, hi, John. This is DJD. Uh, question about the rate of fire of the MG42 on a bipod. I recently fired 30 rounds each from it and a ZB26. I fired an FN mag and a Bren a lot in the past. The MG42 seemed to fire a lot faster than the mag. Certainly does. And for sure, the 26 and the Bren. And it felt like it would be difficult to control in combat use, yet it's regarded as one of the best general purpose machine guns ever. Why? It was universal in that it could be assault on the shoulder with a sling. You can shoot it from the bipod. You can shoot it off the left pet mount. You can shoot it off the anti-aircraft mount. Uh, high rate of fire was desirable if you're shooting at aircraft or moving targets. Uh, it was a, you know, the, you watch the American propaganda films of the time and they try to convince the soldier watching the film that Oh, it's not that bad. It's Barker's worth in its bite. They run out of ammo real quick. Yeah, that's, oh, <laughs> because they're shooting holes in me. Yeah. That's why. Um, so uh, you and I have had this conversation before on the range. There is an ergonomics. A human being is part of the recoil system mm -hmm. of a machine gun. And, and you've observed, and rightfully so, that the slow-firing ones can be really good and really accurate, and the fast-firing ones, there's a sweet spot. For the mm -hmm. being. And then there's the ones that are in between, and it's no matter how hard you try, you just can't quite. Yeah, they're harder. Do what you got to do. Yeah. And so, is it is why is the MG42 considered uh, so effective? Like, the, the short and, and you know, maybe the terse answer is well because it was, and and that's the way it was. It was lighter to move around, easier to move around than the Brownings yeah. were. Uh, you didn't have to worry about the, the cloth belts. Uh, and later, you know, the metal belts came later, of course, and you had the 19, 1986s oh, uh, and stuff like that. Got a question but about even, that. There, there you here, are. So, so you, just, you just answered my I, question with that, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> I think there's, there's a situation where you can look at a gun on paper and it can look really good or 
it can look really bad, perhaps, depending on the gun. But the qualities that are most relevant for field use aren't necessarily the ones that you're looking at on paper. Right. And sometimes you just don't recognize that until you've gone out and shot them. And think about the doctrine, too. And this was on a previous interview we talked mm -hmm. about, and it was a great question about the, the German machine, use of machine gun doctrine compared to the American or the other country's machine gun doctrine. It was well set up well for set the up, 42. And well set up for the 42, and they built the squad around it. Yeah. And one, of my, one of the examples I like to use is the MAP-49, which on paper looks like a pretty generic not that great submachine gun. It's awfully heavy. It's got a craptastic wire frame stock. It's got a single feed magazine. Like none of these are things on paper that would make you think, ah, that's going to be a, a good gun. But in the field, they were pretty well adored. Like mm -hmm. they're, they have a fantastic reputation. And it's because the things in like, okay, the magazine design isn't ideal, but it worked. Like, it wasn't bad enough that it actually caused problems. Um, same with the stock. The stock's not great, but it's good enough that it, it works. And then the factors that don't show up on paper as well, like the durability. You know, how many times can you accidentally slam that thing on a rock or you're climbing into an armored vehicle and it gets slapped into the, the doors or the roof? Or how much abuse can the gun take without actually breaking? Right and remain reliable in poor conditions, those, those, the reliability and the durability are really hard to get on paper. And when those are really good, and some of the ergonomic, you know, some of the paper factors are mediocre, you can sometimes end up with a gun that's actually extremely well-liked. And here's something else to consider. And, and, and here's something. If you're a soldier and you're carrying that gun, and I, every once in a while I get something which I think is really cool, I see a gun that comes to the doctor, like, ooh, look at the wear pattern on that gun. That gun was carried on a shoulder for miles. And see what they're how can you tell? How can you tell? I, they call me on the phone and I try to talk them through it. But I'll use the Thompson as an example. I've had several veterans who carried the Thompson in the wars, and they said, Thompson is great if somebody else is carrot. Have somebody else carry it and then want to get into close combat, hand it to me. I'll, because he said, quote, no matter how you carry that sucker, it's going to gouge you. <laughs> yeah. And he, and he knew because he carried it. We are sitting here as primarily recreational machine gun enthusiasts. I was in the Army for over 28 years. I carried the guns that were in the Army during my tenure in the Army. Didn't ever have a Thompson in the inventory for me to carry. Um, as I carried the machine guns I carried, and I thought the M16 was fantastic, I could carry it on my shoulder, and I could fire it upside down if I needed to in a pinch, and I was good with it, and I felt comfortable with it, and that's what a soldier needs to have. Uh, as far as, you know, Thompson versus Mat 49 and stuff like that, there are things that you say, it looks good on paper here, here, and here, but you get it into the soldier's hands, and they'll tell you what it was. I'll tell you something, what's one of the best machine guns? Carl Gustav Model 45. I've talked to veterans and veterans and veterans, and they don't let go of them. And they you brought them back from Vietnam, and they're not leaving their hands. That's a great example, because you look at a Carl Gustav on paper, and you're like, the stock sucks. It's wobbly. The grip's awful. Uh, the magazines are also... No, the magazines are good. The magazines are double magazines are good. But it's a heavy gun. It's a badly balanced gun. It's very simplistic. It's just a gigantic slamming bolt. Why, what on earth would make that a good gun? And it's that same sort of... Get it in your hand yeah. and shoot it. Yeah. Like the only. Yeah. Get it in your hand and shoot it and then tell me, ooh. <laughs> yeah. So there it is. So uh, going back, James asks about the 1919 A6, which oh, is, gee. <laughs> if you're not familiar with it, the A6 is a Browning 1919 A4 with a bipod clamped onto the end and a shoulder stock really half acidly clutched onto the pistol grip. Um, how effective was the A6 as a stopgap measure to create a squad level machine gun? Is it as awkward as it looks? I never carried one in combat, but I've talked to the people who have, and they much prefer the 191984 on a tripod hmm. to the 1996 on the bipod with a stock. Okay. Especially if they weren't carrying it. And, but, uh, it was a good, there were some, there were some really good things to recommend it. Um, I can speak, I, mean, I didn't shoot it. I talked to veterans who did, 
and they told me what they preferred. Uh, I'll say that the 1986 and its original configuration of secure and machine gun is an incredibly, incredibly sought after mm. machine gun. But that's very different from whether it was good in the field. <laughs> it was it, and it was it good in the field. It was better than the BAR. It was better than the M14. Uh, so, what do you have? What do you have as an alternative? Right. In the American Army. So, kind of. It was a by good default, squad firepower weapon. By default, it did fill the gaps. Yeah. Um, my thought, having I've never, I actually, I don't think I've ever actually fired an A6. Um, although I have done some, like I have a semi-auto 1919 that I have an Israeli A6 conversion kit on. And it is definitely awkward. Um, there's nowhere to hang a belt box on it. The belt box just sits next to the gun and then inevitably falls over. And you serve belt, a weapon. Yeah, your belt fills up with dirt. Um, they're heavy. Uh, it's funny, the, the load, I remember I was doing some research on this for my World War II small arms book. The A6 lightweight Browning is actually heavier than the A4 because what happens is the A4, when they, when they set it up, they're dividing the weight out. So you've got the gun and the mount and the ammo. And on the A6, one guy is carrying the gun and the mount and it weighs more than a just stripped A4. Awkward. We used it for a long time. Didn't replace it. Yeah, but it was the thing until the M60. It's like the you know people talk about the Japanese Type 11, 1922 until 1945. Long time. So, a 1919 A6 versus M60. It's a pretty obvious to me. That's a very easy decision. The M60 is absolutely the more desirable gun to use. Um, I would say. If you're going to be in a place where you have your armor or support, you can take that M60 every time. If you are cut off and you are going to have to use that M60 without any replacement parts or support, you will wear things out on that. Yes. Uh, but probably not an issue. I think I take the M60. Yeah. So uh, to me, that's a bit of a measure of how good of a stand-in was the A6. So, like, it works. But there were probably very few people who were angry that their A6 was replaced. Always, by and this is why I want to caution the readers and you. It's like always remember and try to put things in the historical context of when they were developed. Yeah. When they were used. Well, and what were they up against? All right. So here's the other question for you: Someone hands you the option of an A6 or an MG42, which is tactically what the A6 was trying to create: is a gun that can be used by one man in the assault. Like a forty-two or a thirty-four. Forty-two guns the one I would choose. I'd take either a thirty-four or a forty-two over a nineteen nineteen ace. Absolutely, I would. Because it is a kludge. And it, the forty-two gun is so much more versatile to do so many different things. Yeah. And supporting and, and in the recreational world too. It's great. You know? Aside from ACC, aside from the obvious considerations of weight and reliability, what has been the most important improvement in man portable machine gun capabilities from the early days to today? What have we gotten better? From the early days to today, where have we gotten better? Well, we've been able to use stamped metal pieces to lighten up the guns. Ah, uh, he says, except for weight. Ah, reliability. I'm sorry. Except for weight, <laughs> except for weight and reliability, what have been the great improvements from the early days of machine guns until now? Without weight, I've got two in mind. Go ahead and put them out there. One of them is feeding devices, because the early guns were either cloth belts or box magazines, um, and often kind of wonky box magazines. Today. Uh, we have metallic link cartridge, metallic link belts that avoid the problems of cloth belts. They give you an increased capacity compared to magazines. They're good stowage solutions. You look like a gun like a PK. And, and the other one, the other one is easy, and it's the modularity that we now do with our guns and the ability to move things around and make different things. You know, the stoner design, the ability to snap on bipods and change barrels easily. And, that is, that's as, as big as having the internet come onto the scene in the, in the world. You know, it just changes the whole game. I was going to throw out ergonomics as well. 
So I think about the early machine guns. I'm going to think the Madsons, Lewis, the 0815 Maxim. Those are all awkward guns to handle. Even the BAR. It's not bad, but it's awkward to handle as a machine gun. And you compare that to the modern stuff we have today. 240s, with, with saws, Negevs, oh. PKs. Like I said, the handling is much in, more in intuitive. the combat area, I'd have my weapon on my shoulder on a sling. And in a pinch, I could just <laughs> shoot it upside down in seconds and hit what I'm aiming at. So, you know, good luck with the OA-15 or oh. other things. Or know. the Hotchkiss Portative. That's the real winner for shoot that thing from the hip. Drop the bipod off it while you're moving it around. <laughs> I dare you to shoot the Hotchkiss Portative from the hip. Nathaniel asks, are variable rates of fire on machine guns actually practical? Well, if you, if you, all right, you're going to exclude the, the three shot burst versus the full auto. Yeah. You're talking about, well, look at the Guardia de Seville, the Spagna Astro Type F. It's got the adjustable rate of fire in it. In it. it works. Does it matter? Is it practical? Is it actually useful and helpful? I think it was more of a sales pitch than anything else. I like the idea. I think it's a cool thing on the ZK-383 and the very sought after machine gun because of it to have that weight you can put in and out of the bolt to change your rate of fire. But, gonna... is it, but, is it, but is it really useful in practice? Right. That was going to bring that one up. Like, I don't just, know. You're going to pick I'm the one that you like. And I'm, not gonna, gonna I'm not going to say that it, it's all that... Useful in practice. You, if you want a machine gun that shoots slow, get a machine gun that shoots slow. If you want a machine gun that shoots fast, get a machine gun that shoots fast. It's a sales tactic. I can see a, a utility on a general purpose machine gun. Well, yes, because you want for aircraft. Although anti-aircraft use is... Or aircraft to aircraft. Yes, although that's less of a consideration today than it used to be. Much so. I mean, yeah. it's not a consideration on aircraft. Nobody's no, no. putting machine guns on aircraft, really. Um, and anti-aircraft, like, yeah, maybe you shoot at helicopters. How many seconds are, is your sights going to be on that aircraft? Actually, you know, you know what? It's totally practical today because you're going to be using it to shoot at drones. That's right. Um, Just hearing today about how the, the Ukrainians are becoming the very best at converting civilian drones to yeah. militarizing them. The one gun, actually, that comes to mind that has a, an eminently practical adjustable rate of fire is actually the Soviet DS-39. We were just looking at some video yeah, of that, that's right. and it's it's not multi-position adjustable. It has a low and a high, and the high is for aircraft, and the low is for not aircraft, and it's two little adjustments. You change the gas port, and you change the buffer spring, and you don't have, like, even the buffer is just, like, push in and rotate, and it pre-tensions the thing, and it goes from, like, 600 to about 900, and 600 is a good rate of fire for that thing on a tripod from a, you know, infantry position 900 yeah you could go even higher but i think 900 is probably about as much as they were able to do with a quick change setup and that 900 is definitely an advantage for oh i need to shoot down that medium-sized drone that's right. buzzing our position it's unfortunate that everything else about the ds-39 was a catastrophe <laughs> um when it comes to like normally the, the guns that we see today as adjustable rate of fire it's as much about adjusting to keep the gun running when it's dirty. And by increasing the, the rate of fire, mm. uh, that's like the secondary side Why'd effect. Why'd they put the adjustable gas port on the Bren gun? Or the, Z, the ZB-30J, for example. Right, it's to adjust it, it for different ammunition. Or, and, uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and if your ammunition got a little damp or wet and it lost some of its ginger, you can enlarge your yeah. gas port to it. And, uh, to me, that's practical. The, the rate of fire adjustment that is the, like, the side effect of that isn't really a big deal. Like, 600 to 900 RPM is substantial and ha can be useful. Going from 600 to 700 or 500 to 650... It's more uh, about how controllable is the gun. Are you able to put the rounds into the target you want to put your rounds in? Or... Are you just wanting to make a beaten zone to suppress the enemy? Yeah. Uh, I'm of the old school doctrine. I'd much rather put one between the eyes of my opponent than make them duck into cover. What do you think about the adjustable rate of fire on the BAR? Slow versus fast, where it's like 400 and 600. 
I prefer the semi and full. I vastly so prefer semi. A semi, I, and I had a conversation with an old sergeant major earlier in my career, and he said, you're going to love it. You can shoot that BAR semi very accurately. If you have an E2, you have to put one round in at a time to get that same accuracy. That's no good. But yeah, you can really hold that BAR on target on semi and put that round right where you want. Yeah, the slow and fast 18A2. Yeah, it, okay, it's a sales stack. <laughs> You've got that on the FNDs cool. as well. I, I'd like to blame that just on the. 18, 1918 A2 being bad in every way that it was updated. But <laughs> FN did it too. All the FN BARs are Gee, what a good idea. Fast. Let's buy it. It's better than yeah. the other one. It's different. Look at how ingenious we are. Uh, hot take. I think that explains a lot of the interest in modular multi-caliber firearms today. Yeah. It looks cool on paper and then nobody actually ever does it. Uh, what do you think is the direction of modern machine gun ownership today? Where's the where's the hobby if it if we're to describe it as a hobby collecting? Where's it going? Right now, um, I would say the water cooled guns are on the wane, and the uh, the more modern guns are hot as can be. Where it's going to go is that I think you're going to continue to see. Uh, interest con increasing um a lot more people have got firearms now than ever before uh part of it is in, in the distrust that our government can actually take care of us the way they should and people are getting more to the idea well if the police can't do it i need to take care of it myself and uh, and the natural progression of firearms ownership is to go from having your personal defense weapon hey this is fun I'm going to do this. Or I, I took a couple of uh, young people in their 20s out to the range for the first time. Neither one of them had ever had anything to do with guns. I started them off with a 22 bolt action rifle. And then by the time we were done, we were shooting a ZB-26. And the young gal was, looked at me and said, this is awesome. I want to come out here every time that you do this. Where can I buy one of these? And the answer is, well, first get $40,000. She didn't, she didn't do that. They're, they're pretty realistic about that. But they really enjoy it, and uh, and so I think I think I see a uh, I see it continuing. I see young people coming into the into the hobby. I see new bidders every time when we have an auction, and uh, so I I think that uh, we have a healthy viable hobby. You and I have talked about this a bit before. You mentioned. The machine gun community used to be a relatively small number of people with very large collections. It was pre-internet. The people who were really passionate about machine guns essentially hoovered up all the machine guns because they became that guy who knows about machine the, guns. The key people like Lawrence B. Smith and Dolph Goldsmith and Kent Lamont and uh, and uh, you know you could there's there's a whole whole bunch of them. The the the, the grand old Collectors, they knew where all the guns were, and they, and they got large collections of hundred plus. I'm not going to forget to mention Dick Ray. Large collections of machine guns, and uh, and they collected them, and they were relatively inexpensive compared to the median income of the United States. Right, because there wasn't a huge group of people who understood how to get them, who were interested. Machine guns today, uh, military military style firearms today are more socially acceptable and more popular than they very have much, been. very much in vogue yeah. now the 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 attitude of the population in the united states has shifted uh, so uh, now those large machine gun collections of 100 plus guns 200 plus guns in some cases a thousand or more guns and there are some out there i want to see one of those uh, i've walked across <laughs> a four thousand gun machine gun collection once upon a time and uh, now what's happening, they're getting broken down and they're becoming 10, 20, 30, pretty, pretty diligent collector these days who has more than 50 machine guns, who's, you know, not 70 or 80 or more <laughs> years of age. Uh, and, uh, and they're just too expensive for most people to con contemplate having a, 
a yeah. large and, and, and widespread collection like that. It's a lifetime achievement. Right. Well, part of me would be very interested in living in a situation where I could acquire a thousand machine gun collection that are relatively inexpensive because nobody else is interested in them. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I think it's a it's on the whole a positive to see those collections uh, dispersed. I don't know that democratized is the right word for it, but to see to see them in the hands of more people who can enjoy the hobby um, instead of having them all not I, all. I have I fairly frequently come into contact with widows who are disposing of their deceased spouses machine gun collection. And they, I hear several times, I want them to go to someone who appreciates them. And my response is generally and usually, the amount of money somebody has to pay to get one of these in public auction means that by the very nature of what they have to pay, they are very interested in, in valuing them. Very few people just off the cuff on a whim buy a machine gun that they actually didn't want to have. Yeah. Uh, there are there are collectors, there are investors, there are speculators. Yeah. Which one are you? Which one are you? <laughs> yeah, I think we all know which one I am. We know which one you are. And I know which one you are. And you know which one. The I audience am. may not know, but you're a, as hardcore of a collector as they come. Yeah, I guess I will. I will not even begin to deny <laughs> that. Deny that. That's what I do. I'm certainly not an investor, and I'm absolutely not a speculator. Um, interesting question here. Knob Creek has for a very long time been a locus of the machine gun community. It was a massive shoot in Tennessee, Kentucky, Tennessee, Kentucky, Kentucky. right um, on the back of Fort Knox, actually a couple times a year. And it was the machine gun extravaganza. That's, and now it is no more. Um, the, I don't remember how long it ran, but it was decades. Yes. Um, how will that affect the community? And is there a re like is there a substitute that's it, shown up? It has absolutely affected the community. And I'll tell you what it really is. It occurred, and people ask me often, is there going to be a replacement? Who's thinking about it? What are we going to do another one? What's going to what's happening? What happened was it took years to build up, but it became the place. If you had machine gun parts, if you were a machine gun dealer, if you sold ammunition. If you sold anything that might be related to machine guns, that is where you went. Whether you were a collector, an investor, a speculator, a buyer, whatever you were, dealer, that's where you went. And it reached the point where it reached that critical mass where it would feed on itself. Everybody would plan once or twice a year to load up their van, their half track, whatever, their Volkswagen even, and they would stick stuff in there and squeeze it all in and they'd head off to Louisville and Believe me, Louisville loved the money that came in there twice a year. And they would they would shoot their machine guns. They'd be around with people who thought and liked the things they did. The deal, you can go to the dealers, and you can get that great piece or part or rare thing. And the dealer's like, oh boy, I'll take this here. I got this out of this whatever little tiny gun show corner over here. That's a, that's a, a brass catching bag that goes on an MG34. Nobody knew what it was. I bought it for 50 bucks, and I put it in Knob Creek, and I got 400 for it. Oh, boy, this is what I like to do. Um, and for the guy who looking at I need it. All the MG34 parts, etc. Oh, my God, there's that leather football. I need that. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful, and I put it on there. So that was the big place. And when it demised, there are, there are others out there, and I'm in the east there, I'm going to one this coming weekend down in, uh, down in Yellow Springs, the Lost Machine Gun in West Virginia. Um, I'm going there. That's a really good event. And it could become the big one in the East, but what you don't have in it, you don't have a large number of vendors. You know, there are the people who we know are the, the, the people who are really into the machine guns, you know. Right. Knob Creek was a shoot and a show. Right, yeah, you know, Dennis together. and Jenny Todd were always there with their great stuff. Yeah, Kurt Wolf was always there with great stuff. And Dolph Goldsmith was always there, even when he was in a, in, in a cane, <laughs> he got hauled out there. You know, Bobby Landy's was there. Uh, it, was, it was just a, a wonderful event. And, and now to have something like that again, you, you, as the person putting on the event, have got to attract those dealers in there. It's, 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 you know, if you go to an event and you bring your stuff and you've just spent four days 
five, if you figure loading and unloading, a lot of time, stuff, and money involved, time and yeah. effort, you bring your money, you bring your stuff out there and you walk out of there and you've spent $4,000 or $3,000 in trans transportation to get there and you walk out of there with $1,000 or $2,000 in receipts because there just weren't that many people coming through and buying your stuff and you say, I just spent how many days of my life and lost this money. To lose $2,000. To lose $2,000. And they're like, no, you're going to have to do something for those people to say, get them here. And you got to get a bunch of them here. And it, and it isn't going to happen in one year or two years or three years. You've got to have a plan that's going to be long. And you're going to have to make it worth the while to get those dealers in there. And then you got to get the public. You got to have the facilities. You got to have the hotels. You got to have the restaurants. You got to have the road system that will get you there without it. Oh my God, I'm behind that stupid RV. I can't stand this. Do you think it, an eventual replacement to Knob Creek has to be a show and a shoot? Do you think a show could? I mean, there are some machine gun, sort of machine gun centric shows. No. We have um, Star West. Star West. The one. Is, I mean, without. Knob Creek, that's probably the biggest machine gun oriented show now. That is absolutely the place. If you're machine gun oriented, you want to go. The big sandy machine gun shoot is the one in the Oklahoma okay. Full Auto Shooting Trader, which is also this coming weekend, um, is, is, is exceptionally a great place, great event to be at. Um, it's in the fall now, and that's nice because it's not going to be so stinking hot <laughs> out there. And you don't have to worry about you know traveling on Father's Day and all that kind of stuff. So that's really. So the, does it need to be a trade show and a shooting event? You'll never have another Knob Creek-like nexus unless you can put the two together okay. again. You can have shooting events. You can have large shooting events. And you, people will come and do those shooting events. But until you get the dealers to come with all their parts and their pieces and their guns too, you'll, you'll never get the same draw okay. as you did. The synergy just won't be the same. Huh. One last one from the Reich's beer minister. <laughs> what kind of rare and unusual belts or systems, links, types, and feeding systems on machine guns have you seen that have a high historical value and are a nightmare for anyone who actually wants to shoot with them? What are guns that are high historical value and is a nightmare for people who want to shoot with them? Hmm. Yeah, like what kind of feeds, feed things are a real problem? Like what that hinder the gun from a shooting perspective, not a mechanical perspective. But. Hmm. Let's see. Well, there's certainly you could talk about the Type 11 feed hopper. I don't think it hinders the the gun, but I'll tell you right now, you can lose a finger if you let that spring. And a lot take. of those have broken parts. That's a fragile feed mechanism. It's a feed mechanism, yeah. If you break to break those little fingers off, well, there's one right there behind you. Yeah, you strike like to break those little. Little uh, feed things off, uh, you know, you're in the water. But the Japanese kept replacements. They, they had two on their belts, and they just dropped them in. But a, a feed system that hinders the gun, depending on where it's used, cloth belts in the Pacific Air Theater of Operations, kind of a hindering to the gun. Maxim 08 belts are becoming a problem for people who want to shoot 08s or 0815s. They're 100 years old and more, unless you got some of the ones that Stemple made using Vickers tabs that were in recon, you know, re kit, armor's kits. It's getting tough on the on the Maxim. Um, you best bet is to get Russian belts. Then they're pretty durable still. And you can do well, but there are Maxim 08 belts out there, but even I who have them say, do I really want to put that through a gun and chew one up if it's in really good condition? Yeah. No. Another thing that has that is a hurt for the uh, for the water cooled machine gun community. But it it's like okay, you could almost say by definition, if you had a feed system for uh, for something that hindered the use of the gun, it wouldn't be in use very long, would it? You can think about well, loading up the MG fifteen no. saddle drum. <laughs> There you are. Yep. You don't have you don't have that scissor mechanism. You don't have those little things there. You're going one after the other, one after the other. Or that, the, the Rybell. Right. 150 yeah. round single side drums. Right. That, yeah. That requires a significant. You got a machine. Tool. You better have that machine or you aren't doing anything with it. Yeah. Um, but there's, but 
there, there are all these different things. You can talk about the Lewis Pan magazine. You can talk about the Hotchkiss feed strip. You can talk about the, the Madsen belt fed feed mechanism. Oh. You know, there's... There are a lot of guns out there also where the feed mechanism is just very rare relative to the gun itself. Right. Like the 45 caliber... Um, yeah, the S1100. MP34. Yeah, yeah, the S1100 commercial right. and 45 ACP. The number of guns in the registry is pretty close to the number of magazines known to exist. More in magazines the country. in the registry than there are. More, uh, gun. more, more guns in the registry. Not, not, I found out not really, but there's, as far as guns concerned, not very many. And magazines, not very many. Yeah. Very, for sure. Nambu mags are not as bad, but similar. Yeah. Like Nambu light machine gun mag is fifteen hundred dollars these days. Type one hundred machine gun <laughs> magazines are impossible. Yeah. If you, you know, if you've got more than one, good good for you. <laughs> yeah. You know. But the, the the question is, do we have a magazine feed system that hindered the operation of the gun? Wouldn't have lasted very long, didn't last yeah, very long. Sense. If it was the case, um, I'm trying to think about what maybe the Italian Breda thirty would be the one I would put at the top of the list of the dumb magazine system. I kind of like or, that one. You do like the 30? Or, I'm sorry, I'm thinking the 37 I like. No, the 37 I like. The 30 like. with its stupid 20-round stripper clip thing. And the open yeah. side, like on the Show Show magazine. Oh, that's a wonderful. What could possibly yeah. go wrong having a nice open-sided magazine? Well, that when it rains, the water will run right out. You want cleans to it out. Clean, cleans the mud out. It. The key to um, your show shots, leave the mags out in the rain. Yeah, because, well, <laughs> if you're in a rainstorm, you don't have to worry about the mag getting filled up with water, right? I'd That's actually, always my biggest concern, is that my magazines will fill up with water. And you have seen some of the BAR magazines have a little hole in the bottom, yeah. because they got wet. And then they're like, oh, we'll put a rubber cover over them to keep the water out. See, that's going to take care of it. So. All right. Well, this is, we've been filming for quite some time, and uh, I think we've made this long enough, and I'm out of questions. So a big thanks to everyone on Patreon who submitted questions, and a bigger thanks to you, John, for coming on and uh, chatting with us for it's, a while. It's, it's very enjoyable for me whenever I do these question and answer sessions with you. <clears throat> I much appreciate the questions, and I, and I hope that you found them informative and entertaining. Uh, that's kind of what this that Ian and I do is about informative and entertaining. Here, here. And historically interesting. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.